Welcome to the very first of the speaker series planned in conjunction with the exhibition History is Really Black or White at the Agnes, Ent Agnes Eppington Art Center um, in Kingston, Ontario. My name is Jason Cyrus. I am the curator on the exhibition. And today we are joined by Anne Garret, the conservator, and uh, Professor um, Anna Arabindan Kesson um, from Princeton University. And um, before um, we jump into our conversation, I wanted to give you a bit of an overview of how our conversation today will go. Um, rather than have it be too formalized, we thought we could kick off by sharing a bit of, about our project. Um, Anna will share a bit about her book as well. And then we'll engage in what I hope will be a lively and somewhat informal conversation um, about the synergies between um, these projects and, and I think their potential um, for learning and, uh, for, and the takeaways. So here, uh, we're here today to talk about cotton and trade, labor and humanity, but we cannot talk about any of those things without talking about land. And it's very, very important to share that Queen's University and the land of which the Agnes is situated on um, is and has been the traditional home of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee nations. As an immigrant settler myself to Canada, um, I'm Guyanese Canadian. Um, I come from a country that has been primarily taken care of by the Arawak nation. I have a very complicated relationship to land. Um, and in my own work and the work that I hope to, um, to be a part of projects like this centers at its very core, um, a relook at history and in the ways that colonial practice, um, the very framework of colonialism um, has removed agency and histories from um, many people groups, um, indigenous people um, being one of many. So I hope that this serves as um, one small step towards reconciliation um, and that the conversations we're having today can be part of, can be one drop into that larger bucket where we can um, take a critical look at many of these, many of these very, very important topics. This conversation um, is part of the exhibition speaker series and the exhibition sits within a wider framework um, called Agnes Reimagined. And the Agnes Edmonton Art Center is at an interesting time in its history where we are reimagining what curatorial practice and what artistic intervention could look like. Using the wealth of collections that, that, um, that we take care of, um, continuing to curate and care for community engagement and relationships with, with communities and having an honest look at relationships that we have not um, cared for in the past, as well as opening up the Agnes to be a place of learning and, um, and conversation through engagement with students and artists um, and communities, as I said, this is part of, of a new era. And um, we're hoping that you will visit um, often and whether that be digitally or, in, or physically. And um, this will be part, like I said, of, of a new era of, of replacing and restoring story. So what I would like to do first is um, just share a bit about um, the speakers we have today. Um, and from there on, I will share a bit about the exhibition itself. Okay, so like I said, my name is Jason Cyrus. I am a curator um, of fashion and textile. Um, my work primarily looks at exchanges between cultures um, across history, as well as its connections to our contemporary period. I use fashion and textile as a lens of doing so. And I completed a PhD, a master's in um, art history at York University. And I am now in the middle of a PhD at Warwick in the UK. And I have been the Isabel Bader Fellow in Textile and Conservation Research at the Agnes. And my work um, is looks across the fields of installation, conservation, and um, curation. I'm being joined by the absolutely fabulous um, Anne-Marie Guerin, who is uh, the conservator who has worked on this project. And um, 
Anne-Marie is a recent is a grad of the master's program at Queen's University in art in art conservation, and she has worked in several heritage and art institutions, including the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts and the Canadian Conservation Institute. Her own work um, shares an inter interdisciplinary focus, um, as well as collaboration across art conservation and curation. And um, we are so fortunate to have her here today to chat with us. I'm very excited to introduce um, Anna Arvin and Kesson, um, whose book, amazing trailblazing book, um, Black Bodies, White Gold, um, which please make sure that um, becomes a part of your, of your reading and your frameworks going forward. Um, Anna is um, an assistant professor of African-American and Black diasporic art um, at uh, the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton. Uh, she was born in Sri Lanka and she completed um, an undergraduate uh, degree in New Zealand and Australia uh, before um, uh, finishing her PhD in African-American studies and art history at Yale. And very inter interesting to note that she was um, also a registered nurse uh, before moving over to um, academics. So um, what we will do is I will share a little bit about the exhibition itself. Um, there is a, as of course, there's a physical exhibition at the Agnes, but um, our digital director, Denuda, has created a fantastic online component um, that's accessible through the Agnes's main page, as well as the digital Agnes platform, where you can experience the exhibition. Um, uh, and see the, its main talking points and main objects. Well, what I thought I would do is just to, to set this up, so this is our very first um, series, is to just share some installation shots, um, shots and to give you a little bit of an overview of what the show is about. And I will share screen. Bear with me as I set this up. Thumbs up if everyone can see it. Yes, okay, I, I've got some head nods. History's Black or White primarily looks at um, the cotton trade with a focus um, in the 1800s, from the late 1700s into the very early 1900s, but our main focus is the, the period of the 1800s. And we're looking at cotton garments in the Agnes's collection of um, Canadian dress that's held at Queens and interrogating the garments from an aspect of scientific testing, conservation, and um, uh, the historical cotton trade. What you're looking at here is the first gallery that sets up the garments on a platform in which we are presenting garments that are, are a cross section of the um, of society. And each garment you're seeing here is either entirely made of cotton or has cotton elements in it. Behind you, you're seeing um, a world map in which we are using artworks from the Agnes's collection, um, both from its Canadian collection and its European collection, that through situating them on the map, we're trying to give you a sense of place, um, whether it be uh, locally within Kingston or in the wider uh, cotton supply chain, whether it be uh, ports that were important to um, ships and uh, ships that would have transported enslaved people or um, ships that have taken other goods, or whether that would have been um, a uh, point of retail, like a store or anything of the sort. So the, the on the left, um, get my directions right, on the left, you'll see a map legend that guides you through um, the use of the artworks in different places. And the exhibition has been enlivened, um, has been subverted and has been entangled by contemporary art which is why we're so excited to talk to Anna tonight, um, where the artist Karen Jones, um, Damien Joel, and Gordon Shadrach have each um, 
loaned and um, collaborated with us on artworks that have that we're using to really bring the history of the cotton trade into the present and show that the legacies that have taken hold specifically during this time are still very much with us today in the way that um, we live and work and are on the land. What we're seeing here is Karen Jones's installation Freed. Uh, Karen Jones is an interdisciplinary artist uh, based in Vancouver, and um, she created this site specific work uh, for us. This amazing um, blend of cotton, of cotton balls that she has interspersed with um, black hair, which we will speak to uh, much later on, but it encircles a beautiful wedding dress from 1893 that is entirely cotton. This is installation of our conservation story that Anne-Marie will speak to very shortly, in which we're trying to really break down the silos between conservation and curation of research. The conservation practice is very, the conservation field and um, the work is very central to the exhibition. And we have put uh, many of the processes up front for folks to come and engage with and understand, and that's available digitally as well. The next gallery um, takes you from, so the first gallery would have done this big overarching um, framework in terms of the cotton supply chain, where the cotton was coming from, um, what were the ships involved, the port cities, and so on and so forth. The next gallery takes it from this wider look into a more um, specific look at the humanity involved in this and restoring the humanity and shedding um, a more specific light on the humanity of um, the enslaved folks who who picked and harvested the, the raw cotton is the central focus of this exhibition. Sorry. This gallery we're seeing here, um, the Songs of the Gullah fashion story by artist Damien Joel, um, who is Jamaican American. And Damien's installation here, whether it be in film on the garments themselves, focus on the Gullah Geechee Nation that have been that are settled in the uh, southern coast of the United States, um, all the way from uh, North Carolina down to Florida, along the coasts and regions and the Sea Islands. And Damien has created an installation that speaks to their history, their present, and their future. I love these photos. Every time I see them, I, I smile. We will speak to Damien's work um, later on in our chat. So we've gone from the wider supply chain. We are now looking, we've looked at the um, specifics and the humanity of one people group that would have been working on the cotton. Now we're following that trajectory through the underground railroad into Canada. And this last gallery looks at its connections into the way that we live in Canada today. And we could say more broadly in North America today, uh, based on the legacy of slavery. We're seeing here um, black dyed garments from the Agnes's collection, a map of the Undergong Railroad, um, artwork by Toronto based artist De um, Gordon Shadrach, who is a portrait artist who paints the portraits of, of, of black people, artists themselves, or creatives. And we've put them in conversation with some fantastic um, loans from the Ontario Archives and Queen's University's Rare Book Library. Here we're seeing um, some tintypes of formerly enslaved individuals settled in, in what was called Upper Canada, but we now know, know it's to be Ontario. Um, on the far left is a very generous loan from Jack McKendry, who's a, uh, a Kingston scholar. We've paired these tintypes with um, a first-hand accounts of the enslaved, as well as allegorical accounts. You're seeing on the left, the very first um, print issues of um, the Underground Railroad by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, these are the first two volumes, so they still include a number of errors that have since been corrected, as well as the name of the character that has changed. And we are extremely fortunate to be able to, to show these accounts. In the middle, you're looking at The Voice of the Fugitive, which was um, the first Black uh, newspaper in Canada, where 
It was based in Sandwich, Ontario, which is now a, um, a suburb that has been amalgamated into Windsor, Ontario, just across the, um, the river from Detroit. And this newsletter was used in many different ways, to um, one of which being to, to communicate to um, the enslaved and the descendants settled in Ontario, um, other folks who had come along um, in the underground railroad and whether it be a sense of identifying them or being able to connect with loved ones or other folks that you would have known. On the right is a north side view of slavery. And while Uncle Tom's Cabin is an allegorical account based on um, the life of Henry Josiah, a north side view of slavery is the actual account of the of formerly enslaved um, and freed individuals who escaped to New Underground Railroad and in Canada. It is separated by um, town, and we've opened it here to the story of Eric Brandt, who was settled, who, funnily enough, in Sandwich, Ontario, where Voice to the Fugitive was based. And um, it's a little hard to see it from this image, but I hope if folks are able to come to the gallery physically and go get, get close up to the case, they can actually read um, Eric's story, in which he talks about the actual process of leaving and then being settled in Canada and how after he was settled here, life was not um, was not the bed of roses that I think we always historically look at Canadian history um, in relation to um, American history. There was still a lot of racially fueled violence, segregation in many different ways. And this is where the exhibition really starts to pivot, where we look at the legacy of um, the cotton trade that has produced those beautiful garments um, within the Agnes's collection and connecting the way that these legacies have been entrenched systemically and connect to the way that we live now. Um, racism is very much still a part of our experience. Um, many different intersectional phobias are as well. And the exhibition really starts to I think trouble this notion of can is a safe place and start to have a critical look at where do a lot of our viewpoints and ways of seeing come from. Here we're looking at other tin types from the Ontario archives of formerly enslaved individuals. And Gordon Shadrach's work powerfully brings this history to the present. Gordon's portraits are very much in conversation with the tin types and they present a lot of contemporary individuals, some of them are creatives themselves sometimes in historic ways and sometimes in contemporary ways. And it's that difference of seeing people and the way that folks look different and how our perception of them might be different based on their skin color or their dress or the way they're presented and what the implications for their own lives might be and their safety. Um, we think of the public death of murder of George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, so many, um, uh, so many others whose names we don't know as examples of, of how dangerous it is for the Black person and how your very identity and the way you are perceived by others and how you dress yourselves could literally mean life and death. So in this gallery, I hope folks will spend some time really thinking of the ways that the cotton trade and the garments that we saw previously and the, folk, the people who are involved in their own humanity and their being removed from land, how that legacy has led us to a lot of the ways that we live our lives here today. With that, I'll kick it over to Anne-Marie who will share a bit about the conservation story and the scientific testing and um, how we were able to bring these other lenses into telling the Okay, so my part of this project was really to um, ground uh, and bolster Jason's story that he's trying to tell through uh, through the exhibition in the materiality of the of the garments. Um, so one of the one of the first questions that uh, Jason um, asked me to um, look at is where the cotton came from. And um, part of the idea of, of doing that, of finding um, evidence of where the cotton came from is really just to ground the collection, the Agnes's collection in the global network, in the supply chain of cotton to um, basically just bring 
uh, really strong evidence of the presence and the participation of Kingstonites and, um, and Canadians of the 19th century in the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade um, and in the every part of the cotton supply chain. Um, so uh, our process was really to um, look at the Agnes's collection, uh, try to see what frame we wanted to work within in terms of history, the history of the garments, um, really try to find the, the, the moments in history that we wanted to represent. So for example, um, the, the use of slavery in the Southern United States really sort like it expanded a lot in the late 19th and um, sorry, late 18th, early 19th century. Um, a lot of that had to do with uh, the Haitian revolution and um, what was happening in the Caribbean. Um, and so we wanted to look at what the transition period was like uh, when cotton became more, um, when uh, slavery was being used more in the United States, in the Southern United States. Um, and then following that, when there was the abolition of, of slavery in uh, the UK um, and how that impacted whether or not the UK was still importing cotton from, from the United States, um, where slavery was very much still happening. Um, and then because trying to find out essentially the trajectory of the cotton through from the United States to Great Britain and then being imported back into Canada. So essentially we looked at all of the garments that were cotton that we could find and that involved a lot of microscopy and other um, methods of analysis like uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy as well, just to make sure that everything we were actually sampling was cotton. Um, and we got in touch with the, um, the QFIR, the Queen's Facility for Isotope Research, which we were really lucky to just find that it was there because I didn't know <laughs> that it even existed um, before uh, starting this project. And they were really amazing, um, immediately on board. Yes, this is an interesting project. We wanna work with you. Um, and I think that for me, this collaboration, this kind of through way between um, the stories that can be told from um, by historical garments or artworks um, that can be told from these garments and how we can kind of work in an interdisciplinary way to bring these stories up and to really bolster some of the stories that have already been told for centuries um, is really part of uh, what this project for me really was about is being this bridge between storytelling and the scientific analysis. Um, and then this part that we're looking at now, which is the conservation story, kind of goes through that entire process. So this is the um, some of the analytical, uh, the microscopy that I was mentioning earlier. So this piece was particularly interesting because it's um, one of the earliest garments that we worked on. Uh, from between 1790 to 1820, um, probably more towards 1820, but um, what was really interesting in the microscopy was to find that the front of the, of the uh, waistcoat that we're looking at, all of the wefts, so the, the, the fibers that we're seeing, threads that we're seeing going from left to right is uh, cotton, and all of the fibers we're seeing going up and down, so the warp, that is all silk. So it was really interesting just from a material point of view <laughs> to look at this object. Um, and we also found out that the entire lining is cotton. So we had lots of different cotton elements to test with this garment. There was the, the lining, there was a lot of the thread was cotton as well, and then um, parts of the exterior of the, of the waistcoat. Um, I just, uh, this slide is kind of interesting. It kind of shows what one of the typical ways that cotton is um, identifiable. Uh, and that is by, if you see this kind of twist that's happening in the fiber, that is really, really typical of cotton. And you don't always see it because sometimes when cotton is treated a certain way, um, that that uh, twist kind of is lost a little bit and then um, and it can end up looking a lot like silk. So that's when we end up combining different methods. So microscopy with um, FTIR that I mentioned earlier for your transform um, infrared spectroscopy. Um, and then that can help us uh, understand really what the material is just by combining these different methods. Um, yes, so this is the isotope analysis I was, I was um, talking about a little bit earlier, getting in touch with QFIR. Um, I didn't know that it was even possible to find the origins of cotton um, until I looked into 
um, essentially contemporary analysis of cotton because I found out that it's impossible even or very difficult today to trace back the supply chain of, of cotton and many other materials. So when companies, um, fashion brands, for example, um, kind of claim an ethical source of their cotton or that it was uh, responsibly sourced, it's really difficult to be able to claim that and be sure. Uh, so these companies that want to market their cotton that way or their fashion brand that way um, will go to isotope analysis researchers to make sure that uh, their cotton didn't come from a place where slavery is known to be used today uh, or child labor, so, such as um, areas of China and um, places in Uzbekistan. Uh, so those are two of the major ones, but there are many, there are many other places as well. So um, it's kind of coming, for me, it kind of comes full circle of this like trying to source where the cotton came from and where the history not just the history, but the, the humanity of the supply chain is because we separate those so, so readily when in fact they're, they're so connected. Um, and I think that that's what, we're, what, that's what this exhibition is about. It's about connecting uh, the humanity with the supply chain. Um, so that's uh, just sampling from, the, from the, uh, the waistcoat that we just looked at. Uh, so that's me sampling um, the thread that runs along. Uh, one of the other challenges uh, that we had is we didn't know if we would how much material would be needed to get uh, representative data of isotope analysis. So um, we ended up doing a lot of pilot tests uh, with contemporary cotton that we just purchased in stores, uh, spe specifically cotton that we know came from um, Texas, uh, South Carolina, and Georgia, um, as well as some historical samples um, of like extra lace that had been left behind by somebody that didn't, you know, that comes from the probably the turn of the century or maybe the late um, 19th century. So we ran those through isotope analysis first to see how much material we needed to get something representative. Um, and we were so lucky that it, it ended up being just one milligram of material because if it was much more than that, it would have been um, considered really unethical to take that much uh, material out of a, an historical garment. Um, so then the uh, samples um, basically are sent to the lab in these little tubes where they are washed with a, do I have a picture of that? No. Um, they're washed with a, a combination of uh, chloroform and methanol, um, just to make sure that what we're testing is really what is in the, the material and not anything extra that was accumulated over time. Um, and then it's run through uh, GCMS, so gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. Um, basically what happens is uh, the material is combusted at a very, very high temperature um, so that it breaks apart into its multiple elements and then gets caught into um, a tube I, that is uh, that basically can then measure the mass of each element. So that's the initial process. Then each element, so the elements we tested is carb are carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Um, um, so that's the first part, but then you, in order to do isotope analysis, you need to break down that um, even further so that you can measure each, uh, the number of isotopes per element. And um, this is gonna tell you where the garment came from because uh, plant materials and animals and anything organic that is living will have accumulated over its lifetime. Uh, a number of analysis from these elements based on where they where they live. So for example, for a cotton plant, depending on the water cycles around it, it will have accumulated a certain level of each isotope, uh, of each uh, elemental isotopes. Um, and then you can, it kind of ends up being a, like a fingerprint of that, that type of plant growing in that region. So um, one of the aspects of this work that is a bit challenging, especially considering historical garments uh, or historical anything, is that um, with environmental changes, um, these can this can change over time, um, and it depends a lot on how much material you've, you've accumulated. Because what you need to be able to do is to compare that data with other existing material. So the more um, cotton isotope analysis we have done, uh, the more specific we can be about where the cotton came from. Um, so this is really just 
the tip of the iceberg. So there is a lot of cut analysis that's been done that is contemporary. So that's really useful to us, um, but there isn't all that much historical cotton. Uh, and so I, I'm kind of curious as an aside, I'm kind of curious to see you know, if there's this much differentiation and um, if, we can, if we can do this work on multitudes of garments, can we just um, specify more and more um, the cotton supply chain? Um, and I, right now I'm kind of thinking about it in this very analytical, very um, uh, kind of, obje not objective, that's not the right word, but it, like the thinking about it this way seems to remove the humanity from it. Um, and I think that that's something that is useful sometimes, like in science, for example, like people try to do that. I don't think personally, I don't think that it's really possible, but the idea is to really be objective about the information that you're getting. But if you're only looking at it that way, if you're only looking at it extrapolated or, or taken away from the humanity of what that, that, um, uh, of, of that supply chain, you're really just looking at data and it's not gonna, it's not going to be uh, meaningful to anybody. And the way that this becomes meaningful um, is through um, an exhibition, for example, or some other art form, some other media where this information can just bolster um, the stories that have been told um, and they're, st they're still being told. So I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> um, but uh, this has been kind of um, my point of view in this project. Um, been to try to be like a bridge between um, the stories we're trying to tell, the ways in which they impact people's lives today, um, and then also just this very sciencey kind of, you know, um, removed thing that we, we always consider science to be so removed from us. Um, but it can be, it can be really a, a useful tool if it's then kind of, um, put in a context, I suppose. And I think that that's what we've done in this exhibition is put this very sciencey thing into a context that makes it really meaningful. Um, anyway, I think I think that's, I, I hope it didn't go over time. Thanks, <laughs> Anne-Marie. Uh, <clears throat> as you said, what's important is that uh, the science gets put into context and we have tested the garments in the, in the cotton garments that are in the, in the exhibition and we've been working with the isotope lab since I would say, was it early spring? Early I mean, spring, we, summer? We contacted them right at the beginning, like in February. In February, <laughs> right. So we yeah. this, so then the testing process uh, wrapped up um, in early September. So the raw data has been generated um, and we are waiting on uh, Dr. Da Dr. Dan Layton Matthews, who is the uh, associate professor at Queen's University and mm -hmm. co-director of the facility for of research. He's one of the very few people who has the expertise to interpret the data and the combinations of um, isotopic elements that are is generated in the output, um, who can really in interpret this and be able to tell us, based on those findings, where's the cotton coming from? So. You are um, just as on the edge of your seat as we are, <laughs> as we are waiting um, for the results to be announced. And we will layer those into the physical exhibition and put them up online as well. But um, I, I just want to uh, do but, a, a shout out to uh, Evelyn Ludzik also, who yes. was like the, the, the person who made everything happen in the lab. So I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> I have learned if you're here, we love you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> A very key, a very important component of the exhibition is not just a combination of historical research, but the use of contemporary art to bring these lenses together in conjunction with um, the science and the conservation to be able to tell the story of the humanity that is the foundation of the cotton chain. I cannot tell you how excited I am to have Anna Kessin share um, about her book, Black Bodies, White Gold, that it was so interesting for us to be working on our separate projects and then to realize the synergies that exist within. So Anna, um, please uh, give us an overview of the book before we chat about the connections with Erin. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm just gonna share my screen. 
Uh, so first of all, um, I want to say a huge uh, thank you and congratulations to Jason and Emery for an amazing uh, exhibition. I haven't seen it, um, unfortunately, but I've seen it online. And, you know, um, for us academics who are sort of stuck away from the, the world at times, it's just amazing to see um, how, you know, how your work is in synergy with with other um, professionals and with other people who are thinking in a similar way. And I, and I have to say, you know, this is my first book and it also just made me feel like, oh, I'm not completely crazy. <laughs> you know, someone else is thinking this way. Um, because I think in fields like art history, sometimes this sort of um, transnational, transhistorical framework is, is sometimes hard to sustain um, and hard to create just because of the, the limitations of, of disciplines and, that, and, um, and they, maybe that's something we'll talk about later. Um, I do also want to acknowledge that I wrote this book, I researched for it, I'm talking to you about it from unceded land. Um, I'm here um, in Princeton and I'm sitting on the unceded territory of the Lenape people. And I just want to acknowledge elders past, present and future. Um, and I think talking about cotton, you know, we have to start, as Jason said, with land and with that those processes of, of genocide, um, of clearance uh, and of transatlantic slavery to really understand the continued implications of um, of these visual and material histories today. And so my work uh, and my book really, I think, does what Jason um, sort of ended his presentation with by saying, you know, what is it or where do ways of seeing come from? And as an art historian, and I think as, as a former health professional, that's really what shapes everything I do, my teaching and, and my research, right? how, how, do, how is it that we see the way we do? How is it that um, seeing influences the way we value and relate to others? Um, and how can we dismantle and redesign those frameworks? And so um, the, the book also came from the work of contemporary artists and I'll sort of unpack that as I go. But, I wanted to start with this work by Hank Willis Thomas, who I'm sure many of you know, he's based in New York. Um, it's called Black Hands, White Cotton. And it, I think, visualizes and materializes the, the sort of uh, intimate histories that I'm dealing with, which is the history of the cotton trade and the history of the slave trade. And my, um, what I really kind of focus on is the ways that blackness is uh, visually constructed, the ways that blackness is formed. Um, and for me, that starting point in terms of cotton and slavery is the economic relationship between the commodity of cotton and the commodity or, or the commodification of enslaved uh, African people who were brought to the, uh, the, the Americas, Caribbean, the US, um, Canada too. Um, and so I sort of take that from Frederick Douglass, who in a lecture to abolitionists in London said, when the price of cotton goes up, so does the value of an enslaved person. And I think Thomas's image here really helps us to visualize that economic logic, right? To, to or rather to visualize the ways, the way that an economic relationship can become a visual framework. And I suppose that's really what I'm trying to do throughout the book is, is really emphasize how this sort of economic logic has influenced and continues to shape ways of seeing. Um, I think another aspect of this um, intersection uh, of economics and visuality um, in the production of, of blackness through uh, the cotton trade is the way that cotton connected different people in different places. And I think that, you know, this is something that comes out in sort of global histories or um, popular uh, popular um, advertisements for cotton as a kind of fabric that connects. But what I think what is missed in those uh, histories is often, as Jason and Anne-Marie highlighted, the humanity, like the lived experiences 
um, of people who are um, and continue to be um, embedded in these global uh, exploit systems of exploitation and oppression. And I was particularly, I work um, in the, my book and, you know, is, is, I work with the, um, art, the artistic oeuvre of the Bena Hamid, who's someone I greatly admire and um, has been very generous to me in kind of helping me frame my research. Um, and this is a work called Cotton.com, which she, which, in which she is ma exploring and materialising the relationship that Cotton created between enslaved people in the U.S. South and um, Cotton factory operatives in Manchester, uh, England. Um, and so she creates these canvases, which are in black and white, so symbolising that intersection. They're on Cotton. Um, they're they're imi they're, she's imitated cotton uh, textile pattern books from the 19th century um, and she's she's also kind of used them to sort of imagine a kind of um, communicate communication right between so cotton as a form of communication um, they're also referencing letters sent by Lancashire um, cotton workers to Abraham Lincoln in support of emancipation so she's sort of created visualizing that network, but above above the the paintings, you'll see a brass plaque, and I think oh, I must have oh I'm sorry I took out the um I took out the the text, but it says he said I looked like a painting by Murillo because I was balancing a a water jug on my a water carrier on my head, and so she's. Um, quoting something from a, a, a tourist or a travel narrative of Frederick Elmstead, the architect who visited plantations in the 1850s, um, where he's describing seeing a young woman walking to the um, cotton fields with water for um, the enslaved cotton workers there. And this woman is describing her uh, abstraction into an image right it's a, she's describing her aestheticization and so I think what what's wonderful about uh, Hamid's work is she's she's showing how cotton connects but but also visualizing that economic relationship of commodification and objectification that that cotton um, mediated in the construction of blackness and so using Hamid's work, I look at, I, I talk about um, the textiles that were actually used to clothe enslaved people, textiles that traveled, and at the top you'll see um, an image of what was called Negro cloth, um, cloth that was made in Rhode Island, uh, in Massachusetts, and it was also made in, the, versions of this were made in the U UK and sent to the Caribbean. Um, but these were these were made in the north of the U.S. and sent to the U.S. South to to clothe enslaved people, and then in the bottom you'll see textile samples that were um, that are striped that were used um, in the trade in enslaved people from the west coast of Africa, um, and but were also called fancy cloth because they looked um, they were brighter they were they were patterned and these were often the kinds of textiles that were used to clothe enslaved people on the auction block. Um, and so the kind of rough, coarse um, cloth used on the plantations is really a kind of regulatory uniform. It's coarseness and it, it you know, it, it was made to look as coarse and ugly and, you know, um, uh, uninteresting as possible. On the other hand, fancy cloth was sort of meant to um, emphasize the, the the value of enslaved people right, on the auction block. So they're doing these two different things, um, but you know they're they're connecting different um, places and different people, um, and they're continuing to do that work of uh, at, you know materializing that kind of economic logic right, of commodification. Um, and in sort of conversation with these uh, works, I also talk or, or look at the writings of enslaved people in which um, this is a Harriet Jacobs incidents of a, the life of a slave girl you know and she talks about hating wearing these 
these clothing, this, 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 uh, this cloth. She talks about how it hurts and it's itchy and there are a lot of different kinds of um, de descriptions like that. And so I see those sorts of interventions um, by enslaved people as a way of refusing that, that objectification or refusing the object as Fred Moten describes it. Um, and then this is a painting by Edward Mitchell Bannister, who's also from Canada. Um, and it's the only work I've seen uh, by a, a black artist in the 19th century that may may be referencing the cotton cotton trade. One of his patrons was a mill owner in Rhode Island. So it you know he he may have been once upon a time because this is made after the Civil War, but. Um, it's quite possible that this family, you know, owned a mill in which cotton was made that was sent to the south. And here, I think, you know, there's a kind of way that this painting we could we might talk about it as a way of um, of evoking that memory of slavery as it's embedded in the landscape of the of the U.S. North um, after after slavery. So again, um, you know, these are just you know ways of trying to disassemble that that visual uh, that visual relationship um, which I call a, sp a speculative vision so what I, I what I argue is that cotton frames a way of seeing blackness that is all about um, the possible the potential for profit as um, it, under slavery and then after the after the uh, end of the Civil War it becomes about the potential of black people to be productive citizens so in in both instances however what cotton is kind of framing or mediating is a way of seeing blackness um, or a way of seeing black people in which black people continually have to prove their value. And I would argue this is something that continues today and is perhaps most, vis most powerfully highlighted in the phrase, right, black lives matter, um, whose lives matter, whose lives have to be continually shown to matter. Um, and so in, this, these are some other images that are other works that I look at. So this is um, photographs of um, African Americans working with cotton post, during and after the Civil War. And I kind of make the connection that, you know, cotton here, there's a sense in which following slavery, uh, formerly enslaved African Americans have to kind of prove how they can become refined into free, productive citizens. And so there's a kind of Again, that visual relationship is being used to to under to frame meanings of blackness. I I I think that this relationship between vision, um, between labor and value, is implicitly or sorry, um, evoked in the work these kind of canonical works by Winslow Homer and Edgar Degas. Um, and I've included this small image of um, an enslaved person being valued on the on the slave uh, in, in an auction because I think you can see right this um, the similarity in the ways that cotton is being valued right in Degas painting that classing with the way an enslaved person is being valued on that and so this is the kind of thing I'm trying to that's the kind of material relationship but I think that's an, another um, I think there's a kind of uh, an ideological relationship there um, that I'm trying to kind of just talk about and and visualize right through my um, through my research, and so I think um, what what I do here is also talk about how we might see in these white um, these white artists' paintings right they are also asking their viewers to visually assess their work. And um, this, we can take this further because both Homer and Degas were painting, painting these works specifically for cotton merchants. Right? They wanted this work to sell. They needed to make money. We don't often want to talk about that in art history. Um, but you know, these, these were works that they were they understood that these were works. These were commodities. Their labor was also being commodified in a certain way. Um, and so I think it's interesting that that they they use cotton and the implicit or explicit relationship between cotton and blackness to also kind of um, mediate their own anxieties as, as white white men white artists in the reconstruction era um, uh, and then 
kind of again to sort of try to highlight an other another way of valuing labor another way of valuing blackness i talk very briefly about that uh, about several artists and who return to the plantation not as a site of um this kind of commodification or uh um this kind of speculative uh, vision but they 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 create another kind of speculative vision in which um you know black labor black life becomes a site of community um formation it becomes a site of of kinship um and so this is a work by clementine hunter a self-taught artist from new orleans who you know lived and grew up on a, a born was born and grew up on a cotton plantation and her paintings really focus on her experiences and her family's experiences of, of working on the plantation and then I kind of I kind of end with the work with um, the work of Jean Kashanabari and um, the ways in which West Africa or Africa in general kind of becomes a new kind of plantation for the in the um, in the minds of the US, of US and British manufacturers at the end of the 19th and the early 20th century. When I say a new kind of plantation, I mean there's a renewed interest in growing cotton in on plantations in, in West Africa. And there's also a renewed interest in uh, West African con consumerism, so West African communities as new markets for American and British cotton production. Um, and what what I kind of try and do is use Yinka Shanabari's work um, in you know where he's this is called Scramble for Africa um, you know in which he's sort of really punning on and I think materializing the speculative project of colonialism um, but also allowing us to speculate on other kinds of intimacies right that cotton might have created between West African consumers and the uh, South and Southeast Asian um, manu uh, Southeast Asian traders that they were working with, um, you know, that they, um, and so the ways that, you know, cotton might help us imagine other kinds of alliances and, and intimacies that, that are perhaps, um, that are also embedded in these colonial networks. And this is Augustino Brunius's painting of a market scene in Dominica in the late 18th century that I think is an interesting correlation to, to Shana Bari's work in terms of the movement of cotton and the kinds of connections it creates. Um, and then I, you know, I think, again, as Jason and Anne-Marie have highlighted, you know, this work is not, it's not just about the history, it's about its continued implications. And this is a, um, when I was, as I was writing the book, I heard about this, um, man at Yale who worked in the dining room, dining hall of, of one of the colleges um, that I actually used to be a, a fellow at. And he um, he smashed this stained glass window of these two uh, cotton pickers. And um, I think that what, you know, it, you can read about it, we can talk about it later, but um, what Corey Menefee did, I think was such an important act of, of decolonization, of uh, disassembling, that I think we're trying to do here, right? But he's also. But one of the things he said was he did that because he didn't think it was right that anyone could had to, had to come to work every day and see these pictures, see these images, and work under them. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, for me, I think that's really what I want to do, <laughs> kind of sort of, you know, in in this. And I think that's what these artists are asking us to do, right? To to disassemble to to break down these these visual frameworks in order to reassemble new um, new futures of care and collaboration and uh, and equality. Wow, thank you, Anne. Um, I self I selfishly want to just hear you talk for the rest of the time, but I I, <laughs> I know that wouldn't be fair. What I think I'm so impacted by as you've chatted and as you've spoken and Marie too, as you've shared your own thoughts is how we keep coming back to the humanity that's the core of the cotton trade. A very basic question I think was posed to me quite recently was why is that important? And why is it important to 
connect cotton to the way we live now and what relevance does it have? And um, I'd like to pose that to both of you, but I can say for my own self, just looking at our, the way that in a sense, working across conservation, curation, um, art historical research and, and teaching as well, the way that the three of us, normally our, our fields are very siloed. Um, we're, they're, they're kept quite separate. As somebody who studies um, fashion history and dress history and the history of textiles and trade, that focus on the materiality of garments, their constructions, the raw materials, the importance of a garment to its wearer, whether um, you know, it would have been something worn at a wedding or um, it would have been something used as a trade item. There's so much emphasis on that aspect of things. And yet as somebody who is racialized, um, I know how important the study of slavery and the study of enslavement um, and extraction and, um, and land and indigenous history is also incredibly important to the way that the other history has come about, but very rarely they are brought together. And whatever the and what I think I really wanted to have a focus on this exhibition is to break down these silos and share in a way that we can collaborate across together and have a way of relooking again at the humanity. And the reason why humanity is important is because we cannot understand who we are now unless we understand where we've come. The ways that we see each other and the way that um Blackness is police now, and the way that there's so much systemic oppression is connected to the very cotton trade. During the eight, I mean, slavery was happening um, obviously before the 1800s, but it's that period where slavery and the colonial project um, and the inventions with the cotton gin and the role of printed machine um, and the political things of um, the abolition of slavery and the Civil War and many other. Um, and as you mentioned, like the solution of parallel histories, the Caribbean, it's Southeast Asia, it's the States. A lot of the, what's happening during that time joins the commercial element of things. And it becomes now part of a capitalist push that therefore then economically entrenches mm -hmm. the systemic oppressions that you're seeing. Like they actually therefore then become systemic. That's when you see wealth concentrating that much more in the UK. Um, the Anthropocene obviously then becomes a part of this conversation because the mills are, are, are um, pumping lead into the atmosphere. You're looking at coal being taken from the earth and you know, in, um, in ways that's environmentally detrimental. There's so many ways that you can layer this on, but you know, also the largest amount of black of Africans are being trafficked across the ocean during this time as well. And it becomes part of economic system um, in addition to cultural and a political one. And that way of seeing blackness as something to be a policed as an economic cog, as something that is just as, and as you just shared in those images, you know, you're evaluating the black body in the way that you're looking at the quality of the cotton fiber in the way that you are evaluating a ship and the way that um, it should be enlarged to take more people and goods that way of seeing has not left us because it becomes entrenched economically and in our structure socially that has led us to the system of, of, of seeing blackness and marginalization as something to be controlled, which leads us to a long history of incarceration. Um, and what I what I what I, I think is so important about restoring the humanity is that it just, just allows us to break down these silos, but it allows us to ask per highly personal questions, I think. Um, I ask, I think it's important for me to know when I go through the world, when I encounter conversations or whether I receive reactions, where that's coming from and how they all come together. Um, so Henri, perhaps I could ask you, I can give Anna some time to catch your breath as well, but um, in, in, in what ways is it important for you to you know, bring the conservation, the science together with restoring the humanity in your own field? Uh, well, I mean, to, at the risk of sounding really basic, <laughs> I feel like it's just, if we're not doing that, then what are we doing? Like, what, what's, what's the point? Um, and I, I know that you're, you're asking um, kind of more specifically, but 
if we're not if we're not here to make um i guess to understand ourselves and to understand where like for myself my own colonial mindset comes from and my own interactions and like all of the things that make me feel uncomfortable if i'm not here to try to understand that then what am i even what am i doing like what what's the point like so i think that the only way that we can um i guess make better systems <laughs> that work better uh and that make people happier in general is by looking at where where are we now why are we here um exactly like you were saying um we i think that there's this um there's a reason that um science and uh academia even and so many uh, well, all the structures that we live in right now, like, there's a reason why there are si they are siloed. There's a reason that um, we are we are we are taught that we have this discipline and that we are experts here and that we we shouldn't talk to that other person over there because that that might cause some discomfort or, you know, um, and I think I think that's what's really important to break down is to like. Um, I mean, everything is is connected. Like if we look at that economy, um, the supply chain, you you can't talk about these materials and how even like the clothing we're wearing now, we can't we can't we're not separate from from the materiality. We're not separate from the supply chain, um, and and we're um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm making a lot of sense, but um, but um, in you know bringing the humanity into uh, conservation is I mean I, I think that like also I was I was taught in my in the way that I was taught about conservation that um, ethics are really really important um, it's not just about you know like uh, put it gluing things back together and like you know here we are here's the thing and it was never broken haha <laughs> um, we were taught uh, really to think about why why this object is even on our desk you know um, it it's it's on our desk because it was collected at some point in some way. Uh, sometimes we know how, sometimes we don't. Um, sometimes it was in a, in a really cruel way. Um, and you can't, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, um, why, why is this here? And why am I given the authority to, um, to have any kind of intervention with this object? Um, and that, um, you know, bringing back the humanity into science, like that's, well, I mean, it's not that it's not there, but anyway, I think that I kind of made my point, but um, I'm sorry about like the no, you, craziness. I think that's a, <laughs> no, that's it. You, you made a salient point in the sense um, we have an ethical responsibility mm -hmm. um, with the content that we care for and look at to, to tell inclusive stories to care for that content um, because we know it can be used in powerful ways, um, yeah. both to harm and to heal. And yeah. um, I think you're doing exactly that with the conservation and the testing. Anna, for you, in terms of your own lens, why is why would you say, why was the humanity so important to the lens of this book? Um, thank you. Well, I mean, I agree with everything that you all said. Um, <laughs> I, th I mean, I think on a personal level, you know, as I said in my talk, as a nurse, I I saw actually in very um, granular material detail, right, how these kinds of, th these legacies of slavery, of colonialism, like, how they physically continue to Im have an impact on the, the health and the lives and the livingness of people, as well as just the way people are are treated and have access and so I think to me um, any kind of uh, structural sort of analysis that I can do and um, that's actually why I moved into the humanities you know why I left nursing because I, I wanted to be able to to start thinking on a structural level to rather than just having you know it just felt like the kind of um, the individual everyday sort of work I was doing was not individualized everyday work I was doing was not actually doing very much in the end. But um, but I thought any kind of structural analysis that we do has to have has to then have a uh, have an impact on 
lived experience and, and and I think that you know visuality and how we see it's so uh, unconscious I mean in the sense that you know uh, it's as, as a sen as a sensory experience right we need we need vision all the time and I think sometimes that makes us forget that the way we think and um, the way sorry the way we see and how seeing affects what we do um, it does you know doesn't have a kind of connection to to broader histories and so for me that's why I think the story th this centralizing the, the material effects and the materialities um, of of enslaved communities of, of black communities um, of communities who are as you say a, you know oppressed or who sustain the racial capitalism that we live in now um, is really key but I think also just you know as an academic we really need to make these histories the center of of the humanities because um you know we all have to learn about i mean i don't know what, in art history we have to learn <laughs> yes. about you know the western canon but yes you know, that we don't we don't necessarily have to learn about these other histories that sustained it unless you're doing african-american art or South Asian or Black diaspora, right? So exactly, exactly. I think for me, it's also about reorientating that that framework. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point. And what I think is has it's hard to do often in that work is to find red material that is in service of that point, where um, because this lens is is not a normative one. Sometimes you have to get creative with archives. You have to find, as I mean, as we're doing right now, collaborating across different areas, across different disciplines. And especially, um, and I'll speak from my own experience, looking into the history of um, these enslaved individuals that I can um, I'll bring up so you don't have to see my mug again, um, just of the tintypes here. But it, it, in that sense, so many of their names are unknown. Um, there's so much unknown that you don't, that you would love to know more of and that um, are, is lost um, to whether that be in archival keeping, um, whether that be in knowledge creation um, or in oral history stories, um, folks who would, have, who would have kept the knowledge themselves have since passed on. Um, and what I love, I think of, um, the way it's at, I'm just going to show some of the uh, tintypes, some of the folks that I, I'm, I'd like to refer to now is, um, f for me, I, I, I know I struggled a lot with trying to find a way to fill a lot of the gaps within um, the archive and bringing together in a way um, these different histories, or it's, I would say uh, material that's sometimes spread apart different um, archives and different uh, collections, which speaks exactly to the siloing that we've been chatting about, where, for example, the Ontario Archives, um, you know, has this beautiful collection of photographs, some stories we know, some stories we don't know, whereas Queen's and Queen's University will have the Rare Book Library, will have, you know, the North Side of Slavery, where we have the first-hand accounts of folks. And then, um, in terms of specifically to my own way of seeing uh, the clothing, um, sometimes I wonder why is it we don't have the clothing of enslaved people, formerly enslaved people, or people who were born free? Archives generally preserve the you know the rarest, the most well constructed, the haute couture, the the clothing that generally represents white wealth, um, clothing of the working person of um, of just regular folks, it's 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 quite rare and becoming harder to find. I mean, thankfully, I think a, the way of shifting and collecting has changed. And mm. but by and large, when we look at the 1800s, um, it's it's you're it's easier to find you know beautiful worth dresses, which were ridiculously expensive and quite a, stats, a sign of status, than it is to find um, a gown, for example, that would have been worn by um, this woman in the third tintype over here. So what I think sometimes I, I, I 
been trying to pilot on this exhibition in this way of, I guess, bringing things together that are related, but separate related um, as this way of bringing all these stories together and see if you can sell like a whole, something that's more whole or balanced. So we don't know her name yet. Um, uh, we don't know where she's from yet, but we know that this photograph was taken in Toronto. Um, and uh, based on the um, time that she'd been settled in Canada or being in Canada, she would either have to come through the Underground Railroad or she would have been born free. But by pairing it with, um, or for example, we have um, these, the, um, these folks over here, um, where uh, you, know, you, you, can see, you can see the garments they're wearing. And by pairing that with garments like these from the Agnes's collection, of which we don't know their history, um, these could have been donated, we, we're not sure. But by pairing the garments, with the photographs, with the actual accounts of people in the North Side for your slavery, it's hopefully, I, I, I read, my wish is that when people walk through the gallery and they look at the exhibition, they can in a sense try to imagine what an archive holding all these stories together would look like. And at the core of it will be to, as we keep harping on over and over again, to restore the humanity of these folks to be able to then ask questions of archives and be able to then do other research and to see, okay, well, where would that clothing have been? Who would have kept that clothing? Where would it have been? Um, and how can we bring these all together so that we, we, we don't just stand back and say, well, we don't know so much, but we try to use a combination of research and imagining and um, collaboration, bring these stories together. So we're starting to see a more full picture of, of what these histories are. Um, and Marie, I, 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 I mean, I'll, I'll put this out to both of you. I don't want to be too, too, too formal because I don't want to run out of time, but, and Anna as well, was there some way of looking into archives that you had to be more creative with or non normative with to be able to tell the story? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, and and I think you've I mean you've got the main points there perfectly. I, yes, I think that um, for me it was really trying to find a way of working with what wasn't what well not what wasn't in the archives, but what was absent. And I think I think that sense of absence is. Um, is an important place to st start from. So I think you'd mentioned earlier, you know, the kind of trauma of just seeing um, names in a ledger, or or not even let names. I mean, in my case, it was the names and measurements, you know, or descriptions of enslaved people working on plantations, um, kind of abstracted down to their job. So a field hand or a hoe, or you know, because they were out there kind of furrowing. You know, so um, it, so I think, and I was really influenced by um, Sadia Hartman, you know, who talks about working from this space of loss without re-traumatizing those, um, or, or without reenacting that trauma. So I was, um, I think that's where contemporary artists really helped me to think about different ways into that space not in order to cover up the space or fill it, because I, I don't think that's what we're trying to do, um, but actually to to speculate, um, to perhaps um, use the archive, you know, to as you say, to materialize these other other positionalities, um, other histories. But also to just, um, I think, to sit with that loss and, and remind ourselves of what what that loss means for us now um, as well. Memory for yourself, for me. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that that's one of the ways in which um, uh, institutions or systems, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, um, create um, barriers um, for, for important stories to be told, um, especially um, stories where there is absence um, because 
um, one really common, um, I guess, thing to say or to think is, well, we don't know. So we're not going to talk about it because there just isn't enough information. And that that comes from a very like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure part of that is like, again, uh, trying to protect um, ourselves from places where we might feel uncomfortable because we have to confront some things that we're not, we don't like, you know. Um, but but I think it's um, it's just this really easy mechanism of saying, well, because these things don't exist, uh, well, we're just not we're not going to talk about it. So I think it's really important actually to um, to yeah, like reposition our, our way of thinking about these, these archives that might be lacking in information. And first of all, you know, maybe that's not forever. Maybe it's just that there hasn't been a lot of research done, you know, to like find these stories. Um, and secondly, even if there isn't the material, the physical material there, there is a way to tell these stories. And maybe that is through art, contemporary art. Maybe that is through reimagining uh, the archive. And you know, even if, for example, the the uh, the clothing and the Agnes uh, that you you mentioned in reference to the tin types, even if they were worn by white people, and we figure that out at some point, it doesn't take away from that that the show and the gallery saying, why aren't these things possible? Like, why don't we? Why can't we imagine these things as being true? Um, so I think it's it's another it's another opportunity for. Um, various different disciplines to come together and and talk about um, these gaps in our in our in our minds in our mindsets in our in our ways of thinking about things mm -hmm. yeah I, 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 I so agree just especially as you were referencing these gaps in archives um, and you're just chatting about these contemporary art I think one of the the beauties of um, the time we live in is how artists um, are so uniquely positioned to, to be a wider voice of pain, of story, of history, of experience, um, and in the ways that they can bring us together, um, they can divide us, they can challenge us, they can entangle us, um, and one one of the things that when I was reading Anna's book, um, and you and I were chatting this year as well, that we loved about the synergies between Black Bodies, White Gold, and History is Really Black for White, is the way that the contemporary art featured in both projects makes clear the ways that the structures uh, around the cotton supply chain and the cotton trade and enslavement, um, and as you so articulately said, frame Blackness, um, and as we really tried to show in the last gallery, affect the way um, that we see Blackness today. So um, I know I don't want to run too much of time. We have about eight minutes uh, left or so. But I'm wondering, Anna, can you uh, share a bit more of that um, of your colleague at Yale um, who worked in the, uh, is it the dining hall? Um, and just I just was so fascinated by, by that story and the stained glass window. And perhaps Anne Marie and I could pick one work from the contemporary art, from the contemporary section and speak to it. But I selfishly want to hear about that story a bit more. Yeah, sure, I'd love to. And actually speaking of contemporary artists, I just want to shout out Jocelyn Gardner, who's joining us. And I mean, certainly she's one of the artists who whose work um, has, again, helped me think about these archives, their absences, but also the, the, uh, the ways that enslaved communities were actively resisting um, and reformatting right, ways of seeing. Um, and I think that's something that I found really powerful with Corey, with what Corey did. So Corey was a dining room, dining hall worker at a college, a graduate, an undergraduate college at Yale called, formerly called Calhoun, named after the plantation owner and statesman from the South. Now it's called Grace Hopper College, thankfully. Um, and I was a, when I was a grad student at Yale, I was a fellow of this college, so I would eat in the dining rooms, and I the stained glass windows were up there, and so he I never noticed it, which to my shame. And what he did was like one I think one day he just stood up on a table and smashed the stained glass window with the broom, 
Um, and then, you know, he was, I think he resigned and then he was reinstated. But it really brought so many of these questions out, you know, to the, into the public for, for Yale community, for the Yale community and wider community. But it was just, you know, he was, I think what he was saying is like these, um, these images, the, you know, because they're not just images, right? They tell stories, they're telling histories, um, and they're telling us, I mean, they're telling us worldview, they're telling us ways of seeing. So, um, so he was just really highlighting the kind of the psychological, physical effects of, of this kind of, um, of these images, of these histories, um, because they, they continue to, to shape right, how people see each other. Um, and one of, one of my colleagues, Eddie Glad, he's my, the chair of our department, he, he talks about this idea of the value gap um, and essentially, you know, what he's arguing, and I think it's absolutely correct, is that um, in the United States anyway, you know, certain lives are valued more than others. White lives are valued more than black lives. Um, and, that's, and that can be seen in a whole range of structural um, processes. Uh, and so I think, you know, that's, for me, that's really where, what Corey's act <laughs> highlighted, um, you know, how that kind of valuation continues and how it affects the everyday lives of people. Um, but also for me, it's sort of, this is why it matters to look at these histories and, and untangle them and deconstruct them, not simply to reiterate them, but because unless we historicize what, what's happening now, we're not going to be able to, I think, redesign our futures. Um, so, you know, redesign the value gap for an, a better way, way of putting it. Or, um, or smash it to smithereens, I completely exactly. Exactly. Smash it, smash it um, up and rebuild uh, it. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you, the work you're, um, even the core of what you're saying recalls to me a work in the exhibition called Free by Karen Jones. And um, I'm just going to share it very quickly. Um, this is it's this installation based uh, just with cotton and hair. And it encircles a wedding dress from 1893. And just as you were chatting with Corey, I just um, immediately Karen's work came to mind. And it's a sense of, um, I mean, like I said, like I study and look at dress history so often as part of my vocation and my research. But what I love that Karen's work does here is that it shows that we, we literally cannot see the materiality, the beauty of this garment and its social and cultural importance without acknowledging the raw material and the labor in the way that she's layered the cotton and the hair together. And to see one, you must see the other. They are inextricably linked. And we, that's so much a part of, um, of our lens, of our lens then and our lens now. Um, I want to uh, also um, thank uh, Kristen Mariah. I'm not sure she's on this on our chat today for connecting us, um, Anna and I and Anne Marie. Um, and any final thoughts before we wrap up today? Anything anyone wanted to share that we didn't get to? Uh, I know we run through things even though we're over time. But. I, I just wanted to make a comment about um, Corey Menefee's work. I want to call it an artwork <laughs> because it's an intervention. Art, yes. Yeah, it's an intervention, right? <laughs> yeah, um, intervention. yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and I, I just, um, it, it really sparked something in, in me to hear that because there's been a lot of conversation in conservation circles about um, what do we do in instances of intervention like this? Because a lot of the time we'll be like, we will have bosses who's who will want to, you know, um, fix this stained glass and remake it and put it back where it was and pretend like nothing ever happened. Um, and those ideas are being challenged in conservation, um, and they have been. I don't not for very long, but they have been. Um, and I just wanted to to kind of point out this idea of treating um, of, of like. I guess this institution, this conservation, um, and how our our role is not to bring things back to the way that they were. Um, in this in this instance, uh, Corey Menefee 
his work is um, is about what is going on today. It's about feelings, the humanity that is happening today, and that conserving that, however that would be, that we would. Well, for example, the way that it was shown on the slide is all broken. Um, that is what our role is. Like thinking about what we're preserving and for what purpose, um, and who's benefiting from that. Who and, and, and you know where where are we putting the value? Um, so anyway, that it just made me think a lot about about that. <laughs> so I well, to mention I, it. I agree absolutely. And actually, the 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 I think now the window as a broken piece is um, is how it's being held in the in the gallery. I put a, I put a couple of links there, but no, I, I think absolutely that's exactly what we, um, that's, that's, that's the ethics I think in what we do. And I, I mean, I only, I, only thing I wanted to say is that when I saw the slide you, and I forgot to say it's Anne-Marie, when you were talking about um, kind of, there was this, a sentence in the wall text, I think that was saying something about cotton has a history or, you know, um, and I, I just wanted to say one of the artists I do talk about and I didn't mention in my presentation is Leonardo Drew. And he, he has ex almost the exact same phrase. He talks about cotton as a material with memory. Mm -hmm. And he made yeah. this piece um, called, it's like called Untitled Number 25 and it's just six foot bales of cotton stacked together. Um, and I think that's, you know, the way, it was amazing to see the way you were literally showing us these threads, um, these fibers, um, because that, you know, that, that's the kind of work I think, you know, we need to do to, to bring out these memories, which are embedded in, in so many, um, so many materials, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, that we work with and think about every day. So it was, that was a really, I think a wonderful, uh, metaphor that, or an analogy that you were, you know, kind of evoking for us. So. <laughs> well, folks, um, I know we are way over time and we intended to have a little Q&A at the end, but I would want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, the exhibition is on until the um, until March 20th at the Agnes. Uh, there is an exhibition website you can visit. Um, Anna's book is available through Duke University Press. Um, but more importantly, um, I hope this is a platform for further research for further conversation, for further collaboration. Um, and Anna and Marie, it's been, it's been a huge honor to chat with you both. We could do this for so many more hours, you can tell. But um, thank you so much for chatting with me today and for sharing with your work.